listening. I'm listening. Go on. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Masa Washington, and I want to thank you again for coming and working along with the commission. We appreciate it. Thank you. I have a few questions for you, just for the sake of clarification. In your testimony, you mentioned how the NPFL at the time was faring in what was then called Greater Liberia. You mentioned that um, you helped establish the organization from a fighting force to one of governance in terms of the uh, NPRA AG. And you listed the various ministries, some of the ministers. You also stated um, that there was life, normal life and activities going on like everywhere else, like in a normal setting, of course. You also mentioned that you have made money at the time, meaning that the government was, was uh, effective, was functional. My question is, what economic system was put in place to benefit the country at the time? You mentioned you had about 92% of the resources at your disposal. Uh, disposal. You Thank mentioned you. the uh, rubber, rubber plantation, Firestone, paying taxes to you, luck. Um, my question is, what economic system was put in place? How much revenue do you remember was collected during that period of, of the NPRA AG rule? Where did this revenue go? Which bank was it deposited in? Were civil servants under your control area or in your control area taking pay? What was the salary skills and structure? How many schools were you able to either rehabilitate or if you built new schools? What about roads? Were you able to rehabilitate some of the roads? Did you build new roads? And those kinds of issues. Well, that's very good. It's a very interesting question. Uh, but I want you to distinguish between the MPFL and the MPRAG and the MPP. You are talking about all of them as one thing. Now, you've been listening to me, madam, and I expect you to articulate your questions directing them to specific groups. How did the MPRAG as a government pay its employees? What type of economic program did the MPRAG have, have as a government? And who was responsible for articulating that? That is one question. The next question has to do with how the military was paid and what type of programs were in place. Those are three separate and distinct questions you ask on the one thing. But I will endeavor to explain them as, as separate. Okay, separately. excuse me. If you don't mind, sir, I will make a clarification there. Yeah. I was asking exactly my question was in reference to the NPRAG. Thank you. I follow that. Okay. Thank I, you it was, I was going to respond that way. Don't worry about that. I was going to respond in the manner that would uh, make your question, uh, uh, respond to your question now. First thing is, if you want to know the economic program and the financial uh, organization of the NPRAG government, the former Minister of Economic Planning of the Unity Party government, Dr. Toka McIntyre, was the planning Minister, so you can ask him, invite him here, ask him, he will tell you. The Minister of Finance was also a Unity Party stalwart and Senator for Magibi, Senator uh, uh, designate, I mean, uh, for Magibi County, William E. Dennis, he was the Minister of Finance. Invite him as a member of the Unity Party, he will, uh, and now he, he will come and explain to you what he did and what kind of program he put into place. As to what roads were built, I remember very well, and one thing I commissioned as Chief Executive Officer of Public Corporation, I was also uh, Chairman of the Board for the Forest Development Authority, and um, the, the ITR, International Timber Company, built uh, a 242 feet Eki Bridge over the Sestos River, that's connecting uh, 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 Basso to Sino County, and then they built another 148 feet Eki Bridge over the Sestos River. That made the distance from Grand Basso to Sino because the Sempen River, from the center of the bridge from the Sempen River to, to the center of Greenville, is 50, kilo, 50 miles. So uh, there was a road linking Grand Basso, and that was the first time in the history of Liberia that the 
bridge was built over the Cestus River and the Sempan River. Every president from the time I was a boy put in his annual message that he was going to build a bridge across the Cestus River and the Sempan River to connect Greenville, um, Sino to Grand Basso County. But that was done during the war. Uh, uh, and it was built by the International Timber Industry, ITI. Uh, there were several other roads built in Nimba County through Saclipier with other logging companies. The road was being maintained from Logwatuo to to Sanicole by uh, Guy Moulard, another timber company operating in that area. And various timber companies were building roads. You see, they were building the roads that were, it was of, of dual benefit. It was of benefit to them to ship their logs out on, on, on the back of those trucks, those heavy logs, and those trucks. If those trucks could plow setting routes, they had to be done the roofs had to be fixed very well because of the wear and tear on the vehicle and that also allows civilian movement with smaller vehicles to be able to move up and down those roads. So those roads were being built systematically at no cost to the government by the timber companies. I think some of them were tax deductible and, and other things like that. As regards school, the Minister of Education, D. Muslim Cooper, she's alive and kicking and she will be able to tell you how many schools and how many students were available. I know that in Buchanan, Grand Bassa County, I opened four schools and built, we built another school in number four compound, uh, compound number four, a new school which was named after my mother, Florence Webster Allen. That was a, a project that I, I undertook myself. But uh, there are many other people were trying to make their lives normal. Now, mind you, when you are talking about this economic program and thing, uh, in our day, international community thing, you all got now with the UN, you're talking about uh, good governance and bad governance and uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what the capacity building and all those kind of things. That time, people were fighting war. War was on. People are still fighting for territory. People are still fighting against Taylor. Ulimo were there fighting, like you said. This other LPC were fighting from the other end. Uh, uh, IMPFL were fighting. AFL were on the other side fighting. Ecoma were here selling Liberia property and stealing what they could steal. So it was whole thing going on uh, uh, like that. So there was no way that you could say that there was a perfect economic situation where people could project or articulate or to try to put into perspective any sound plan that will be on a long-term basis. I think most things were done on an ad hoc basis because such was the condition and such was the time. Thank you. Okay, um, just to rest on that question, you stated also earlier that the NPRA AG was wealthy. During that time frame of the formation of the NPRA AG to when Mr. Taylor won the presidency of Liberia when he came um, as the elected president, can you give an estimate of how much revenue you think was collected by the NPRA AG government? For what? For when your government was operating under the NPRA AG. No, I wouldn't. I, I told you who was the Minister of Finance, and the Deputy Minister of Finance responsible for that is Mr. Fleming. Call Leola Fleming. I think he works for the Lone Star. He would give you an idea. He was the genius behind this. He's a very smart uh, uh, young man when he come to uh, preparing those type of analysis, and he was very busy all the time on the computer with his staff of men. Anytime I went into his office, he was very busy putting down plan and taxes and, and whatnot. So he and Nau Langley were, were very good at that and uh, they may be able to give you uh, information on that but uh, as uh, when you come to the elections and other things maybe I as uh, I as campaign manager uh, for, for, for the Taylor for campaign would be able to talk more about the elections and the formation of the MPP you did not uh, I did not respond to your question on the transformation of the of the war machine the MPFL into a mass based political party that is a very interesting and important phenomenon, and I've discussed that in chapter 9 of my book, and I think it will be interesting for you to, for people to read it when it comes out in 2010, to understand the concept and the strategy, the political concept that I use to transform a mass, a, 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 a mass-based war machine into a multi 
million dollar uh, a conglomerate and a multi and a, and a broad based political party it is you have to be skilled in doing that it took me time to understand the situation on the ground and to visit all the command headquarters and the stations in the various constituencies 64 of them and to be able to transform that war machine into a political party that's why you see the MPP is deeply rooted all over the country and that was why I was very angry and the partisans of the MPP were very angry the other day when somebody said that uh, the observer reported that the MPP and the UP are the same. They are not the same. The MPP is a mass-based political party stretched out throughout the country and the unity party is a small clique of political activists who uh, went in for political power. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Witness, as a confidant of Mr. Taylor, did he ever um, discuss with you the issue of the $1 million that was allegedly embezzled by him from GSA concerning the Earth Movie Equipment? And what did he say? What version of a story did he tell you that is if you ever had such discussion? No, nobody could tell me that. I was talking directly to Samuel Doe on that issue. And Clarence Momolo is the, was the director general that took over. He's alive. He's here in Liberia. And uh, Tijani Dara was the deputy director general of GSA at the time. And they would tell you that uh, Charles Dillon never took no money. It was $996,000 that was paid to the Dillon brothers, a group of Indian boys who were operating off Randall Street who had supplied carpets to the GSA. And that I didn't need to talk to Taylor about that. I was in Liberia after Taylor left and I was very close to the PRC and I knew exactly what happened. It was all a frame up to be able to nail uh, uh, Taylor in the States because of the threat that they thought that he would come back using the PAL in America to come and destabilize the PRC government. It was just all this. They were, I mean, at the time the Americans were fond of Doe and he felt that he could use that as an alibi but there was no time. And there was $996,000. I think the voucher would still be referenced in GSA sometime as to the money that was transferred to the H, um, HS Dillon who was operating on Randall Street uh, there where you have the Stop and Shop supermarket now. I think they used to have a carpet uh, store there and they were supplying GSA with carpets. And uh, I think they had other carpets for the PRC members, their homes, uh, their girlfriends and their various things and, they, and uh, they paid the check to, to Dillon. And Dillon took the money to the States. Maybe he should have given uh, Charles Taylor some of the money, I mean, as, as was the practice at that time, they should have given him some money, which they never did. When he got to the States and called them, they never answered him, and he never got back in touch with them. So they supplied the carpets anyway to government, and the GSA received those carpets. Uh, whatever, I think they should be asking the Dillon brothers if they did not receive the carpets to refund the money, because Taylor never saw that money. And the, the, and the carpets were worth... The 900 and... Ask the GSA director, Clarence Momolu, at the time, he will give you the details. I'm not here to give details on how much carpet government bought. I'm not PRC government, man. They got people who work for the PRC government. You can ask the GSA director or ask the PRC minister of finance, Alvin Jones, or the minister of, of, of whatnot. They will tell you these things. You know, um, it is very clear. Ask me questions regarding my, 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 my okay, expose um, here. There was a witness who testified in the TRC diaspora hearings in Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, Mrs. Mary Hayes, who testified that she worked with Mr. Taylor at the GSA as his special assistant. And she testified that she knew about the alleged $1 million that Mr. Taylor embezzled. And her version was that, yes, Taylor actually took the money and you are saying that it was a setup he never did. No. Um, well, if, if, if that's the case, then maybe you have to research that and look at it. But I know that the issue that Doe raised was, uh, he raised that issue with me too. Because I remember when I went in and he told me, he said, oh, you see your friend Taylor? Again, if, Doe, if Taylor took uh, $1 million from Simon, he did not sack him from GSA. He appointed him as deputy minister of commerce. Taylor left the country as Deputy Minister of Commerce. He did not leave the country as sacked G GSA Director General. He was in my office every day when he was uh, Deputy. He never went to the uh, Ministry of Commerce for one day. It, uh, he left here seven or eight days after Doe appointed him. He said that he was not accepting the job. And he, he told Samuel Doe, over my day, by the way, I accept that job. And Doe threatened him. They had an altercation, he and Doe. I mean, there was no time that Doe sacked him because he, I said the $1 million issue only came up when when 
they, when they were threatened and thought that Taylor would come, they were threatened by everybody. You know, an insecure and incompetent person is always insecure. Insecurity, there's no medicine for fear. There's no tablet you can take when you're scared, it will, you won't be scared. So fright was the order of the day at the time and the people were scared. So they were afraid of the American Liberians, they were scared. Look at, they say they kill people because Richard Heron's son sent a, a text, I mean, a, I mean, what do you think, me? Uh, facts. These are all stories. These are all stories. Please don't let nobody tell you that. Don't write it in the history of Liberia. It's not true. Okay. Former Vice President Blah on the. Former President Blah. You no, know, he was Vice President. Say, I'm, I'm coming there. Yeah. He was uh, Vice President under Mr. Taylor when Taylor was President and later became uh, President for a short while. He testified a few days ago. And literally, from his testimony, um, he literally presented himself as someone who was uh, absolutely powerless within the government or even the NPFL before it was transformed and before the elected government, to the point where he said he had no voice, literally. Even the defense minister uh, had more power than him. He feared him. And he said no one, he, he didn't give any orders, he, he had no authority to do anything. It was Mr. Taylor who was um, the sole authority to give any order or to decide anything. Yes, that's true. Moses Blah, um, uh, well, he's known for not speaking the truth, but that time he spoke the truth. He was nobody in the MPF. In fact, he was made president because, he was made vice president because of his incapacity. Uh, yes, I argued it. I can tell you one. Let me just give you an incident. Yes, he was handpicked by President Taylor as his vice president. Not because of any skills that he had. Now, when, the, when, when Enoch peeks me to his ashes, Enoch was a very good. When Enoch died, the vice president, the issue came to the executive committee of the party. At the time, I was national chairman. So nobody can tell me. I, I, I will tell you what happened. And uh, we, uh, Mr. Taylor had promised the people of Nimba County that because they stood by him in the revolution, that the vice presidency will always, as long as he's president, remain for, the Nimba, for Nimba County. When, when Enoch Dogole died, he had, in fact, specifically, he had promised to the special forces that they will always be his next in command. Now, Moses Blau was a special force. Enoch was a special force. When Enoch died, it was very difficult to pick from between and among the special forces, which one of them he would choose as his vice president. John Tier, no, he's too strong, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Uh, you know, several names came up and Taylor did not want anyone that strong. So Bla was ambassador in uh, Libya and he picked him. But then we suggested, Senator Margaret Kama was from Nimba County. And I said at the executive committee meeting, listen, we can put Margaret in as the vice president. She's educated, she's articulate, and she will be able to get the women of NIMBA, you know, and uh, she will be able to deal with them and deal with the situation. She's a senator. She has a lot of experience already in the Senate and uh, parliamentary procedure. And Taylor said to me, he said, you boy, <laughs> don't go in NIMBA with Kira only in one day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it's better... Let us get a special force who is able to protect himself and who, who knows how to secure himself and protect himself and whatnot. And I think I want to ask the leader in Libya so that Moses can come and be the vice president. And so, well, we thought, I thought it was a bad judgment and I found out it was a bad judgment. How did I find out? I was in Accra. I want you to follow me very clearly because uh, you, you asked a question and I'll tell you it is true what you said. Moses was powerless. He was appointed as president because of his ineptitude. Not because he was strong in any way. Now, when, 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 um, when we're in Accra, we're in Accra, it was time for Taylor had, Taylor had agreed to turn over the government. Now listen to this, it's interesting. He had agreed to turn over the government to the vice president because he had agreed to exit for the purpose of peace in Liberia. 
So he sent for I was in Accra as head of the delegation. He sent for me by, to come back. I came back, and then at, at that time, Louis Brown was nominated to go and replace me at the conference. He said, you have to stay here with me because uh, there are very difficult decisions we have to make now, and the party has to be involved. And he said, we are thinking about getting the speaker in to succeed me and whatnot. And I said, no, you'll be abrogating the Constitution. We're already in the devil hand for all the things that are happening. Then we come in the last minute and abrogate the Constitution. The Vice President would have to succeed you, as is the case of the Constitution. We have to go according to the Constitution. And everybody in the meeting was concerned. Most of the, uh, 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 what you call uh, the, the core, the seven, eight men, you know, core decision makers in the MP, MPP sat down and, he, and we said it, it would be very difficult, almost impossible for Moses to do that, but we could not, we could not abrogate the Constitution. And I said to him, no, and Moses Blah will tell you that because he was there. And I said to, 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 to President Taylor, if you have to put anyone else to succeed you as president, I will have to resign as party chairman. Because what is going to happen here is if you do not give the vice presidency or the presidency now to the people of Nima County, you got 75% of your battalion commanders are people from Nima County. You are not going to leave us here with those guys there because they're going to level every one of us if we take the presidency and give it to any other county. So you may as well let your vice president go in and whatever the case will be, we're going to guide him and, and direct him and all that. And we did. When Moses took over, I was with him. I, I, I traveled with him on every trip, even though I was not, I refused to accept an appointment as any of his ministers because I didn't feel I should be appointed to any job. At that time, I was party chairman. And so we, I followed him on every official trip to Guinea, to Ivory Coast, to Libya. I followed him on every trip and make sure I guided him. Press conferences, I would articulate things and speak to him and were very close to him. Even he told you the story about the Chinese. He didn't tell you the right story. The Chinese ambassador, the Chinese ambassador from Sierra Leone and the Chinese ambassador from, from in Liberia from, from Sierra Leone, the, the, the Chinese ambassador in Sierra Leone and the Sierra Leone ambassador in Liberia came to my house and the agreement for China to come to Liberia and Taiwan be left out was done in my house and I have the original copy of that draft and Moses was there. He should have told you that yesterday. So decisions were made and we were, we were, we were very much involved in this decision. We had to guide Moses because we knew his level and what he would be able to do before he make mistakes and cause more problems. Not that he was completely, no, no, don't, don't misunderstand me. But that level at the time, to, to, for him to hold that kind of office, you know, at the time of the, uh, the complexities in the country, it was almost impossible for him to be able to do that alone. He had to be guided by people who knew the historical basis of the formation to that point and, and the, 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 the problems. So that is how it went. Moses was right with you. He had no muscle to do nothing more than just a special force that was an ambassador in Libya. Okay. You also mentioned when you um, testified earlier that the NPFL did not have more than 25,000 fighting men. But um, Mr. Taylor at the time uh, he, uh, it was during the octopus, I can remember. He mentioned on the radio once that he had almost close to 70,000 fighting men. He was, I think he had a problem with Ecomoc. They were shelling uh, his, his held territories. And so he was saying that he had about 70,000 men who were strong, who, was re who were ready to even die for him. So how do you... What do you say with this? Um, well, you, you can understand that. You can understand that uh, there were several times that the Minister of Defense, uh, Tom Woolley, there was one time that he was in, uh, I think he was in the States, and we were in Habel, and he made a, a pronouncement on the radio. We had already, we had passed Kakata, and we were in Mount Barkley. Uh, in fact, we were beyond Mount Barkley, almost headed to red light. And, and, uh, and, and uh, Tom, what were you came out and said, uh, we have just uh, attacked Kirisberg and we are moving Kirisberg. And Taylor said, listen, I have fully. You better come on the ground here and see what happening here. You were in America. We already reaching red light and you're announcing that we're in, only in Kirisberg. But that's propaganda. There was a lot of political propaganda. And Taylor did not need more than 25,000 men. Um, he did not need, he, 
he took he took less than five four thousand five hundred men to come down to Morovia and lock Ekomog in their base there and lock up all the lock, put all the soldiers in their base and lock them up. Disarm them in Banga, disarm them in Bikana, disarm them in Mount Barkley, and had them lock up in the free zone there until some of the African heroes did talk to him to, to, to let them go. So he didn't need fifty thousand to do that. He had the strategy to do that. He knew the terrain. Former President Bala also mentioned while testifying here before this panel that there were several uh, hundred or thousand or twelve soldiers in that each uh, group of the NPFO were assigned a child soldier or a, or a group of child soldiers. Now in your estimate, how many child soldiers do you think the NPFL had? I don't know. Or small ball units. Uh, Madam, the military people. thing you're asking about, you're prolonging this thing. I, I think people are getting tired now. Because the military thing you're asking, there are people that will give you roster. You have Daniel Chair here, who is the Minister of Defense. He's coming. He was Minister of Defense from MPREG. He took over from Woyo. He's coming. He was Minister of Defense for eight years in the country. He would have roster of these things. If you ask him, he will give you specifically. He will tell you certain things. Yes, there were a lot of child soldiers, but a lot of these people volunteered to go fighting. Most of them, their parents were killed. Some of them, their mothers were raped. Their sisters were raped. They just saw a group of people and took arms and started uh, and started falling behind them. For example, I used to be angry with a one little boy all the time falling behind me. He had a gun. The gun was even taller than him. Every day they would call him small soldier. And I woke up one morning again. He's lying in my car garage crying. And I said, small soldier, why are you crying? I told you that they shouldn't give you gun because you're too small. He said, gee, I, um, all my friends then go to the battlefront. They can't tell me how they not kill. Me ever say I joined the one K ye. A little boy, little boy that was not even seven years old. I said you won't kill. <laughs> this is the overzealous nature that prevailed during the war. Most people took out arms because of advantage. There was one time here, I think the students of the University of Liberia even holding it against me that when they were fighting war in Moroya, I say the students of the University of Liberia should be co-opted and let them fight too. Why? I didn't say it in any negative means. Because the soldiers who had guns were intimidating the university students. My nephew and cousin were at the university and people would pass around LU because law was fighting them. They would go and intimidate them. Some of them, the people were jumping on their girlfriends. I mean, some of the university students were being raped and all by our own soldiers. And so I said, well, by the way the thing going, I got plenty of complaint now. Let the university students take arms too so they can defend themselves too and help defend the country. But some of them, some of them misunderstood it to me that I said they should go and draft them in and whatnot. They did not need additional men to fight. All he needed was additional weapons. He had enough people to fight, but he did not have the weapon, the arms, and the ammunition. So he did not need to draft university students or anybody. There were so many volunteers that were willing to defend the country, but they did not have, he did not have the wherewithal to keep the revolution going, to keep the war on, or to stop the, the insurgents from coming in, because they were well armed and equipped. Okay. Mr. Allen, I need you to I'm understand. Mr. Allen, please. I'm not no mister. Mr. Witness. Yes. Okay, is that uh, acceptable? Yes, it's acceptable. Okay. Uh, Mr. Witness, I would like you to understand that I will ask certain, uh, certain questions because of your, your close relationship with the uh, NPFA at the time, and then the NPRAG, then the NPP, and then, of course, your close relationship to Mr. Taylor. So I hope you bear with me. I bear with you. Thank you. <laughs> there have been several of various theories around the coup of 1980. Some people believe that it was facilitated by some members of the TWP who were from the right wing, who were sort of upset with President Talbot. They thought he was too liberal. And another group believe that it was the Americans who actually facilitated the coup. While there's been a new theory since the TRC hearings that it could have been the Arabs. Now, uh, you've been someone who, you know, has been around. You said you knew some members of the PRC. You spoke to some of them. Who do you think actually, or what group do you think actually planned and executed the coup? There was not any group of the two TWP that I know definitely 
it was not the true partisans that planned anything uh, to undermine. The true partisans were so closely knitted. They are so focused on one objective and one set of objectives that none of them had anything negative or they would, if they planned that and turn it over to some uh, uh, uneducated military boy that would come and hunt them and kill them, that's suicide. Then you say some members of the TWP committed suicide because for them to have killed their standard bearer and turn it over to uh, uh, non-commissioned officers who were not educated or well grounded, that's tantamount to suicide. And I don't think that any members of the True Party were that naive or, or that uh, um, low in mentality. But um, I know, and I'm, I, I know from a hundred percent point of conviction that the individuals who murdered our president were not Liberian citizens. And they had planned uh, and implemented their operation to remove the president and put a coup of middle level lieutenant colonels and colonels into office to try to push their objectives. It did not work out that way. Um, the vacuum was created uh, and non-commissioned officers uh, took over uh, very, very, uh, very, very uh, unceremoniously, and you could see that it was an, an unceremonial takeover uh, of the country by a low level military personnel. Uh, I don't think that uh, TWP planned it. I'm certain that I'm 100% certain, and I believe 100% the story of Madam Victoria Talbot, a very elder states woman in our country. She would not have to tell a lie of that nature. She would not write it in a book and reference it if she did not have a definite view. She was not speculative about it. She said specifically that the men who, the people who killed her husband were Caucasians. They had masks on, but she could see from their risk up here that they were Caucasian. And I have no reason to doubt Madam Victoria Talbot. And if there was anything wrong, she would try to pin it on the PRC members. But she said that she had no remorse or nothing against the PRC members because she's certain that none of them killed her husband. And that is the account that I'm dwelling on. Coupled with the fact that in conversation with several members of the PRC over many years, that none of them could give me a definite position or time that they planned, uh, orchestrated, and uh, implemented any coup d'etat at all. And the subsequent um, April 22nd execution of the 13 government officials, did you hear anything from any of the PRC members as to why they executed these 13 people? How did their names get on the list? But I think they told you, I think Bama Famula told you here that they prepared so, that list. I think he told you. And the records carry that. I have a recording myself he, he, as part of my speak, book. He did they prepared the, the list of TWP partisans. When they executed those people, I was in the office with, Brigadier, with at the time, Brigadier General J. Nicholas Podia, who was the Vice Head of State. I was in his office when they came to inform him that the execution had been had taken place. And he was very angry, he even mentioned the name of some of the progressives like Famule and, 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 uh, and, and the Bacchus Matthew them, and felt that they were responsible for that. He did mention their name and people were telling him, oh no, don't do that. I mean, he was threatening to eliminate them or something because he felt that they were under it. But these progressives in this country here, you both know they have been the root cause of all the problems in this country. They are the they, were the, they, they started the revolution, they start, I mean, they always throw the rock and move their hand. And the government come, they undermine it. And the traditional government come, they jump inside and become ministers. And then new government come, they try to take a position. I see Dr. Sawyer now, he now employ a governance commission. What are you looking for a job for? They can't attend here. What are you doing with job? The young people here are educated, they are qualified. Give them a chance. Go to your farm. Go sit down. Go develop your property or what you have earned over the years. But you got to be a part of government. Some of them, when they see people, they threaten people. Oh, I will tell the president that they are you not friends. All oh, those kind of talk there. People, when would they outgrow this kind of elementary thing that we did in the 70s? Pointing finger and wanting to be part of every government and every system that come in. These are the troublemakers. They put us in the revolution. We have come in the revolution. Many, plenty of trouble not happy. PAL, Progressive Alliance of Liberia, all these groups here are all groups that led. There. Some of them still in America there. They are here. They are there. Anytime there's an issue, they will come to Liberia, join any government. The same thing happened when Judith Bryan government came in in Accra. A whole group of robots for America came here 
jump up in government, minister of this, some of them, pastor, reverend, minister of this, minister of that. They didn't fight no war. The people who fought the war, they never look at them. The king government squander all the money. They go on back again. They not go in the late shell. When somebody come out that they know again, they will focus again, surface, and be part of that same kind of system to rob the people of what they have. Let us be committed to national development effort. Let us outgrow this petty idea of trying to seek gravy with every government that came. The same thing happening with the Salih government now. Most of the people who came, they not, were not even here to vote for the, the, the President Salih. They were not even here to help with the electoral process. As soon as they found out that she was elected, they all ran back. Some of their wives told them, say, oh, but you are here with Wulu and, and, and these boys. They not go to Liberia and make money. They not buy houses here. And Ellen, your friend, go to Liberia and see if you can get a job. And that all of them here, they come here to fool all again. Anyway, please go on. Okay. Um, still on the list, and uh, the progressives, since you mentioned them, Several members of the quote unquote progressives, including Mr. Oswald Kuya and Mr. Tia Chipo, and a couple of them, um, testified that they did not know about the execution of the 13 persons. They were shocked, in fact, when they heard that the people were being executed that day. Um, Dr. Famule did mention the list, the question was asked, and he did say yes, that the, the government had made a list of all TWP. Uh, members and also government officials for the purpose of just keeping their eyes on them, but he was equally look, shocked look and, and was um, Did you put that in the annals of history, that thing Famula told you? You wrote it down? Don't put it in this history because it's not true. Okay. No, please, let's be realistic. Don't let people come and tell you these kind of stories here, that the government made a list. Which government? He was the minister of what? Education at the time, or foreign minister? Who the government? These boys sat down right in the foreign minister and prepared a list of people named Pabu Neil on that list. Yeah, your commissioner. I saw the list of Neil on it. Are you telling me that they had two party members name on the list? They just wrote people name down and uh, as they went on, they tried, they went to court care people there and a few of them went by and said, this is France Fanon with violence and they read all the revolutionary book and brought France Fanon in. The revolution have to eat certain people and certain people, they got to know that we're serious so certain people got to die. Uh, this is, I mean, that's what happened. Let nobody come fool you here and tell you about they prepare lists to keep tap on what, what, what capacity they have to monitor the people. That's what. Let it do progressive. They will not bring that progressive been here and distort history. Okay. A um, couple of witnesses who have testified here described Mr. Taylor in, in various ways. Um, one person actually used the word that he was just a hustler trying to get some money in reference to his, his role in this entire revolution, as you call it. And, um, who said that? Who, who said that? Well, one of the witnesses. Ah, but uh, I, don't and, uh, I don't think it's true. And, uh, and, and then, thing, I don't think it's true, Madam Commissioner. Do not misquote and misrepresent things. Whoever said that Taylor was a hustler, call the person in, let me address that issue. I would want, I would not address that issue. I ask you not to mention it. Because you well, cannot go around speculating as a commissioner. You have a responsibility to be precise and concise on your issues. Don't come here with no they say or hearsay. Call the person name who said it. Let us know. Am I right or wrong? I will, I will not respond to that question. I will not respond to it because I don't want nobody to come here and try to humiliate. You people are sat here in this country, all of you call yourself Liberians. They humiliated and annihilated, annihilated a duly elected president of this country. Took him out of this country and carried him to some place they call a Hague. And now you coming to tell me that somebody say he's a hustler. What did I want to hustle? He hustled the whole country. He had the whole country. So please, I will not accept that. Well, excuse Except me. Except call the person name, don't well, talk further on that issue, otherwise I won't respond. Excuse me, sir, Mr. Witness, you're entitled to your opinion. But you don't you, want you to answer the question. Your opinion. You are not expressing your opinion. You are expressing a misrepresentation. Well, and I will not accept that. Mr. Witness, I have no reason to misrepresent but anything. But then call the person name for the benefit of the audience. And I will appeal to you to please address me respectfully. As I will I not address you respectfully you. if you disrespect yourself. Okay. When you bypass your respect, you meet up with disgrace. I, I end my question here. Mr. Don't tell me that. Mr. Mr. Witness, Chairman, you have, yeah, to address Mr. This. you have to address your commissioner. She has to, don't come and tell me they say here. Let me tell you something. These Mr. are the kind of things that are causing trouble in the... Mr. Witness, I beg your indulgence, please. Uh, audience, 
audience 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 please Gentlemen, you are not a participant. It's the witness and the commissioner asking question. Part of our responsibility is to follow closely, listen, and understand. This is an open forum, and for the purpose of it being open, is to have you involved to an extent that you gather what's happening. So we beg you, please. Mr. Witness, I, I wanted to make an an input but my microphone was down for a little while. I, I agree with you, we should uh, stick to facts and that, uh, but sometimes in the process of the commission uh, witnesses are protected. Witnesses give testimonies in camera and ask for protection. How be it is also your right to respond in a way you see fit and appropriate. What I would appreciate is that not to interrupt the commissioner, but after she gives her question, and then you can respond in manner and form as you deem fit. Thank you, sir. What is that woman and a question? As in Okay, Mr. Witness. My question was, there have been various descriptions of Mr. Taylor by witnesses who have come to this commission. Some of them have turned has have termed him as someone who did not joke with his power. He was overly ambitious. Former president of Liberia, Mr. Bla, was here a few days ago and he stated that Taylor was someone who did not play with his power. Another witness described Mr. Taylor as someone who was a hustler who just wanted to put or grab put his hand on some uh, hands on some money. Now my question is how would you describe or refer to Mr. Taylor? Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to respond to that question until I know who say he's a hustler. Because if Taylor was hustling, he would have left Liberia a long time. He wouldn't have been president. Because during the MPRA, he had millions of dollars to his disposal, and the whole country, he did not hustle here and leave where he was going to be president to be humiliated for. So I think that's, you know, that's not logical, and that's a, in fact, that's a misrepresentation of the fact, and I, ref I will not respond. Thank you. I think I just ended my questions. <clears throat> You earlier statement, uh, stated, Mr. Witness, during your testimony um, that Mr. Taylor was a brave person. He was fearless. He was not afraid of the UN. You were making reference to um, his um, having access to arms that he had written the Secretary General of the uh, United Nations at the time, um, Mr. Kofi Annan, telling him that he was going to get arms to protect himself and protect the country. And um, he was not afraid of the UN. My question here is, Mr. Taylor finally agreed to leave Liberia in 2003. What do you think prompted this final concession on his part? Because he could have stood up, I mean, from the description of him that you gave earlier. That's a good question, but... Um if you say that I described, I gave all those descriptions about President Taylor, then when you ask me again how I feel about him, you should have heard me and written that and know how I feel about him. But be that as it may, 
I'm certain that if you listen to President Taylor, former President Taylor departure speech, he told you the reason why he left and the reason why he was leaving. He was leaving Liberia so that peace can prevail. The long-awaited peace, the peace that he was not giving or the government was not giving, the international aid and support that there was promised Liberia that they wouldn't give Liberia because he was president, the international support and the light and water and telecommunication and all those things that were promised Liberia. So when he leave, Jack Lyon said they will put a light on, they will bring a hospital ship in the high sea there that will be treating Liberians from sickness. All those things were coming to Liberia. Immediately Mr. Taylor leave. So he said, all right, since they are bringing all these things to Liberia and peace will prevail, I will leave the country for the sake of peace. And that's why he left. I don't think he said any other thing. The record speaks for itself. I uh, begin my questioning, I would just like to re-echo the points made by the chairman, that ours is a task to seek out the truth. And we are Liberians, and all of us were in one way or the other affected by developments in our country. It's only natural that every one of us will hold sentiments in whatever shape or form and opinions as well. But again, ours is a task to perform and we have chosen to do so with sincerity and with commitment. I would like to first ask you about the participation and recruitment of mercenaries in the MPFL. Can you provide some light on that? And the commissioning to serve in high offices of the Republic. As a member and a top key ranking member of the MPFL, what can you say to this? Did you say that the MPFL hired mercenaries? Yes. Is that what you are insinuating? Yes. Do you have a source of information about that or are you just concluding? That's all I want to know. If you, uh, if you want uh, to put it in another way. Yeah, please. You had non liberian nationals, some of whom had been associated with uh, political developments in their respective home countries within the ranks and file of the MPFL, Bukinabi soldiers, some of whom recently uh, placed an ad in the uh, papers in uh, Burkina Faso calling on Blaise Campari to compensate them for their services with the MPFL in Liberia. Can you speak to this? And also their service in positions of authority, as non-Liberians in positions of authority in government. 
if you want an example, I give you the example of Yanks Smite, who was Liberia's ambassador to Libya, a Gambian national. All right. You, um, well, I'll tell you one thing, that the MPFL was 100% Liberian-based organization, as far as I found it. There were other other nationalities who joined in. Now, let me just give you a little history of, uh, of what you are trying to ask. Um, when the MPFL came into Liberia, they came in with uh, a group of special forces. Those special forces were all trained at the base in Tajira, in uh, Libya. Um, and there were other groups of uh, Liberians headed by Samia Doki who had his own group. They did not train in Libya. There was a group training in La Côte d'Ivoire, Nimba, most of them citizens of Nimba County. I think they were in uh, Tulo Play or one of those towns that were, because Doki, after they ran him out of the country, he went to, he, he, had, he, he had knowledge of the other group that was training, but he had his own group and he came and joined the MPFL after they entered the country as a as co-leader. Also, there was a, a group of um, Gambians headed by uh, Samba Sanyang, um, who was, I think, he was the revolutionary leader in, uh, in um, Gambia who took over the country for a few days from uh, Dr. I mean, from Dauda Jawara. And he went back, I think, after the, their coup failed, he left and went back to Libya. And then they joined up these uh, special forces and came down. They were the most disciplined group uh, I could see at the time that we got in there. There was another group of uh, Sir Unions uh, under the command of Fodi Sanko who was also trained in Libya. They were, I think, about 34 of them or 35 of them. Now, um, there was uh, also another, I think there was a Senegalese group or some other, so, some other groups like that, but they were all scattered over the place. Now, these were not mercenaries. These were people who volunteered to come in and assist in the Liberian Revolution, hoping that they would get some redress in their quest for their own revolution. That, is, that was my understanding of that. But they were not mercenaries that were paid to come in or, or chattered to come in because the MPFA had sufficient manpower and as they went along, they mobilized and galvanized sufficient force along the way. University students, when they passed, Cuttington joined in. I mean, a lot of people joined in. Intellectuals all joined to support the revolution and they didn't take very kindly to foreigners being in their midst. So it was very difficult to see some of these foreigners up front or, or, or involved directly, but they were on the ground, they were in Liberia, look, maybe looking for a safe haven also out of Libya and closer to home, and they were here as part of the revolution as it went along. Yes, they were foreigners, but they were not mercenaries. So how did Yanks uh, Smite get appointed as Liberia's ambassador to Libya? I would know, I would know. Yank Smite is, uh, is uh, partly Liberian. He, his parents are, uh, I mean his mother on his mother's side, he's a Liberian. I'm certain his grandfather, I think on his mother's side, on his Liberian, uh, one of the sides, he's a Smite. Uh, he's a Liberian to a certain extent, I think. And you can verify that, I'm not certain. But My I'm research shows me that he's uh, fully Gambian. Uh, I don't know whether how, how right, correct your research is. You have to give me the source of your research. My understanding was that one of his parents or one of his grandparents, somebody, are Liberian, and that is root here. Many people see people and think that they are foreigners, but uh, actually, in essence, they have roots here. I suspect that he has roots here, but I'm not going to defend or justify that. I would deal with that question simply in a manner that I do not know how he got uh, to the position he got, but I think he's intelligent, he's educated, and very literate. And uh, if he was he was qualified for such a position, I don't know whether he was Liberian or not. I mean, that's not the issue that I'm dealing with. So where are they all now? I have no idea. I think Yang Smite is here. He's here. Where are the rest of his colleagues? I don't know. Kukwe Samba Sangyang, otherwise known as Dr. Mali. Samba Sangyang is in is in is in uh, is in uh, Mali. Samba Sangyang is in Mali, and most of the other uh, uh, Gambian special forces are back in uh, in Gambia with uh, their, their president, who was their colleague too. Their colleague, Yaya Jame, was also a revolutionary train in, in Tajira. Maybe you don't know that. I was never there, so I would know. <laughs> 
but you will know about the mercenaries that were employed by the... the I know because I saw them here. I was a journalist. I did oh. some research on them and we published... Yeah, but you should have and, also uh, researched to know that there were mercenaries, Guineans, Ghanaians, Gambians, and all, uh, paid by the British and Americans to fight for Lloyd and to overthrow and remove Taylor from office. But that, that's another matter, and that's with Lloyd. Okay, good. I'm dealing with the MPFL, MPRG, okay, okay, and good. you. All right, good. <laughs> now, you did serve in Buchanan with a group or an, institution, uh, or an institution referred to as the National Hydrocarbons. How was it organized? How did it get this supply of fuel? And what happened to the fuel supplies from Lamco that you met in Buchanan? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Everybody talk about fuel supply in Lamco. Fuel supply in Lamco. When I got to Buchanan, there was no fuel in, in Lamco. The people were scraping the bottom of those tanks to try to get and draining it with cloth and all that, trying to get a little bit of fuel and even mixing it with uh, kerosene and all that. I weigh me how I managed to get products. I told you that the ports of Buchanan, the ports of Sino and Maryland were fully operational and the refineries of the world were working. I raised $196,000, went to the refinery in La Côte d'Ivoire and paid for a, a 1,000 metric ton of cocktail product and put it on a 1,000 ton vessel, a Nigerian vessel I chartered for $20,000 US dollars and shipped it to the port of Buchanan, pumped it out into the rail tracks, uh, into the rail, rail cars and pumped them out to and took them on rail to Ganta, Banga and Sanikul and sold to timber companies. I wouldn't tell you that nobody was hiding. Nobody had to steal the money. I raised the money myself. I mortgaged my house in New Jersey and raised $196,000 and opened a letter of credit. That's how a man does. That's not no labor business. What, the, what, what are or what were the returns on that investment? My return on that investment was over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars because I sold, I bought one product, one gallon of the product for uh, fifty two cents at the time, and I sold it for two dollars and fifty cents. So, war is good business, isn't it? Very good business, and I brought, I brought in another two thousand metric ton. Uh, after that, we bought, we got better offer. Lack wanted more, Firestone wanted more, so we had to order. There was a time we were ordering special consignment for Lack and Firestone, and we had to order consignment for the airport too because jet fuel had to come in they were plane landing at the airport and they had to be refueled I so there was a lot of business going hydrocarbon was no small enterprise would I, would I would i be wrong to suppose that you will be inching for another world to make some more profits well that is very absurd and i would i would suggest that you do not open such discussions because that's what you need to do because you need to survive i'm made okay if we move on <laughs> if we move on <laughs> you need a job, I don't. Go ahead. When the MPFL took over Liberia, mm -hmm. most of Liberia, there were quite a number of significant assets that was located in what was Greater Liberia. Who ordered the removal of the generator from Bong Mines, the generator from Lamco? Um, and why were they taken out of Liberia and sold? Well, I, I do not, you see, um, some of the questions you ask are not relevant questions to my expose. And you were an official, just uh, admit, you were an official of that government. My friend, don't interrupt me. Anything, don't interrupt me. Sense. Don't interrupt me. What is wrong with you? Is there something wrong with you? Don't talk I just when call I'm, you to a point. Don't talk when I'm talking. Talking, okay, let's have it. Don't talk when I'm talking again. I'm calling you to a point. Go ahead and listen to me. You ask your question. I am calling you to a point. Look, Mr. Stewart, I mean, don't call me to no Amishra. point. Look, Mr. Chairman, you don't protect me. I'll leave. I'm yes, not here for any more. foolishness. I will not take it. Commissioner, and you don't talk to me like that. If you don't behave yourself, you know, these are the people. But you have to behave yourself equally. You don't you talk, talk to me like that. No, wait. But you got a man microphone. I beg, I beg indulgence. Uh, Commissioner, as a witness, you better control your commissioners, man. Yes, you. You are right. This, this should be an exercise. This, this should be an exercise. In Commissioner, when the witness is answering, it's good to give the witness chance and not have him interrupted. You know, Mr. just as 
Just as we don't want the witness to interrupt the commissioner, the witness should inter be interrupted. Let's just adapt that posture. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Honorable uh, witness, your point is well made. Yeah. <clears throat> your point is well made. I think the commissioner, Commissioner Seward, also understands that. Uh, it's a two-way flow of communication, question and answer. Just as the commissioner shouldn't be interrupted when he's asking his question, the witness shouldn't be interrupted when he's responding to the question. I beg your indulgence, uh, Commissioner Seward. Well, thank you. Let me proceed to respond. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your protection, but I'm of the opinion that uh, I think you have a breakdown in communication with the commissioner, so I don't think they respect your authority and they have to be seen to do that. They are paid by taxpayers' money. They must respect the taxpayers because they pay your salary. Uh, I don't have to respect you because I, I mean, you know. But let me just give you the answer to your question. You are asking what happened to generators and all that. I told you one thing that I was not, I told you where I was located. I inform you where I was. If you want to give public information on what was sold or what was not sold, if you have your information, tell the public. Inform them. I have not informed the public that you were an informant from, for, for Toba government from Moja. You were working with us in Moja. You were paid to inform Toba government and lie on Moja people that were your own job. You were doing that here as an informant. I have not said that here. I got plenty of things but you. I'm ready to talk. Usually you say you're neutral. You are, I mean, you work for Igno government here. So you all stole everything in this country here. You didn't do anything for the people. You were selling a briefcase, man. Briefcase ball going around right here. You remember Moja? You were a double agent working for Moja and informing uh, uh, Joseph Morris. You were informing Joseph Morris at NSA. They were paying you $30 a month salary. We know that about you. That you want to talk here. You better mind, sir. <laughs> Mind, but we've been here, we've been here on the ground now. Watch it. Mr. Allen, I'm you cannot be intimidating. No call to Mr. Allen. I'm not Mr. Allen. I'm not Mr. Allen. You cannot intimidate me. If you call me Mr. Allen, I will leave. I'm lying. If you call me Mr. Allen, I will leave. But you are lying. Hey, you, come in, you come here to talk foolish. You better shut your mouth and keep quiet. Uh, please. Look, let me tell you something. This man. These are the people who cause trouble in the country, are they, man? You hear me? That way he's there, one-sided. He's one-sided. Mr. Witness, may I intervene, please? If you don't intervene, I will leave. I don't have to sit here. I beg your indulgence. I beg your indulgence. Pay to be here. I'm independent. I beg your indulgence. Commissioner Boo. Go away. Okay, to wait. Mr. 